Okay, thank you and, um, and, and good morning. Uh, thank you for, for uh, attending this uh, Medtronic sponsored session. The title is The Role of Coronary Interventionalist in TAVI from Referral for, uh, uh, to Timing of PCI. So basically, wh what is it about? Of course, uh, for all who are interested in TAVI and, and, and uh, interventional cardiology, but main, maybe mainly it's focused on the need of uh, the referral centers who are working uh, together with the TAVI centers before the TAVI procedure um, for them also to understand what are the consequences of a, of a TAVI procedure on the follow-up of a patient. And also, I think, what is the most uh, important and trendy uh, uh, question, after the TAVI, when you, you see your patient coming back with coronary artery disease, how to deal with those patients having already had a TAVI and, uh, and uh, how to perform PCI through a, a previously implanted transcatheter heart valve. So this is basically what we, what we will cover uh, during the following 60 minutes. So we are a group of colleagues together with you. We have Chiara de, Bria, de, Chiara, Chiara de Bia, sorry, Chiara, Thomas Pilgrim, Danny Dvier, Raquel Del Valle, Flavio Ribikini uh, will help us to, to discuss, to articulate ideas. And uh, maybe before we, we start, uh, Danny, you have important information for us. Yeah, for thank you, purpose. Nicola. And obviously, we have a great session uh, planned here, and uh, you are an important pr uh, part of the discussion here. So I really encourage you to take part, to ask questions, either here in the room through the microphone uh, or uh, through the chat. And we'll include it uh, during the discussion. Yeah, and we'll have one colleague, Mattia Adana, who will uh, manage also the chat for those who are connected online only and uh, you will be able to, to chat with him. So I think, Raquel, we can, uh, we can start with your, your first presentation. The idea, as I mentioned in the introduction here, is to start thinking all together about what happens before TAVI uh, in the referring centers. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today sharing my thoughts regarding the role of the referral center and what can they do to streamline the TAVI procedure. These are my conflict of interest, and I'm an interventional cardiologist performing TAVI for the last 10 years, approximately. So I think we all know that delaying TAVI or delaying treatment of aortic stenosis uh, is related to a worse patient prognosis. So it's mandatory that we try to expedite the patient's uh, journey to TAVI. And the most important key learning here is that we have to work together. It's mandatory that the TAVI Center and the referral center work together in order to speed out this, this journey. So uh, we will try to understand uh, how I think the referral center can help us expedite this process. And the, the referral center is uh, of key importance mainly in three aspects. First of all, in reducing inappropriate referral to surgical aortic valve replacement. Second, in, avoid, in avoiding redundancy of exams, of tests. If some tests have already been performed in the referral, the referral center, why should we repeat them as long as they are good quality? And third, in identifying patients suitable for early discharge and in patient follow-up. Uh, again, the most important thing is that we work together and we are aligned, the TAVI Center in yellow and the referral center in blue, uh, to optimize global TAVI results. Because TAVI is no longer about the implant procedure itself, it's much more than that. TAVI optimal results are based on an optimal patient selection, is based on an optimal procedure planning, and for that, we have to rely on the pre-procedure info we have, pre-procedure images. And most of that information may come from the referral center, so it's essential if we can get that info, not only the reports, but the images, the study, to go over it. And also, TAVI is about post-TAVI care, is about discharge, early discharge, and follow-up. And coronary disease may play a role here, even more important as we are moving to younger patients or patients with a longer expectancy of life. I know we are all aware that trying to standardize the pre-TAVI pathway is really complex, and mainly because there are huge discrepancies not only between uh, countries, but also between regions and even centers. Not all the referral centers have, have the same uh, exams available, and there is a huge 
uh, an equal access, at least in my country, to angio CT scan and to cath lab evaluation. But we have to try to standardize the, pro the, the process so it's easy to refer the patient for TAVI. What do we need in any patient with severe aortic stenosis? First of all, of course, we need an accurate diagnosis based mainly on echo. We need to know the clinical status of the patient and updates on, if, on this status, if the patient's feeling worse or something has happened. We need info on the electrocardiogram because we know that baseline EKG characteristics are linked to TAVI outcomes and also are important for planning the procedure, an example, whether to place a temporary lead or something like that. Lab tests are of utmost importance, but not only the test itself, but we need to know whether the patient has been optimized prior to TAVI admission. For example, has that anemia been taken care of? How's the patient now? Medication is important, but not only pre tabi meds, but also we have to agree on the post tabi medications, mainly regarding antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulation, that it's so important we're talking about coronary disease. Uh, we now know that frailty and cognitive assessment and are so related with outcomes, so it's mandatory to have info regarding that and also know what support does the patient have, family support, or what are we going to do with the patient one discharge, who is going to be taking care of him. All this info is in the hands of the, refer of the referring physician. Not only this, but some uh, referring hospital also have the possibility to undergo coronary angio and CT scan. So if that's good quality, we can use that test. But I think from our side as interventionalists, it is mandatory that we try to make it easy to refer the patient for TAVI. And for that, what we do in our hospital, and I think that's essential, uh, we need a single refer referral point. The referring physician needs to know who to send the info to, where to send the info. So what we do is we receive all the info regarding all patients with aortic stenosis, not only TAVI. We present the data and the heart team, and of course the, the clinician, the physician responsible for the patient is welcome to join us, even in person or online, uh, to take a, a part of the discussion. And then, to our knowledge, the best decision whether surgery or TAVI is, is made, and more important, whether revascularization or not. And now if the patient refers for TAVI, that's where the, the TAVI pathway and TAVI planning starts. For me, there's, there is a very important figure, a key figure in this pathway, and that's the TAVI nurse. The TAVI nurse is the one that will connect the interventional cardiology with the referring physician, will review the exams, what's missing, ask for new exams, and will connect to the patient. And it's, for me, a key point in streamlining the procedure when the patient has been referred for TAVI. So, in conclusion, I know streamlining the pathway is very difficult, very complex due to huge discrepancies between hospital, but each team, we have to try to adapt to our own idiosyncrasy to optimize the journey to TAVI. Interaction, fluent interaction is mandatory between the TAVI center and the referral center, and from that point, I think the TAVI nurse is an essential key point in the pathway. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Raquel, for those uh, essential points. Um, I, um, again, um, you mentioned that there are a lot of uh, regional or country discrepancies. So, uh, if you have um, personal regional experience you would like to share, please feel free to to do that while we are starting to discuss. You mentioned the uh, the point of a CT scan. Uh, and it's true that thinking about the evolution of of uh, the indication of TAVI of surgery when you're sending a patient to your referring, uh, referring center or to your, to your heart team, you're sending a patient with aortic stenosis and a decision has to be made uh, in favor of a TAVI or surgery. And assessment of anatomical feasibility by the CT scan is crucial. So if the refer referring centers want to perform the CT scan, can you provide us with some guidance, with some recommendation on how to, to perform a good CT scan before TAVI? I think that's a very interesting question indeed. Yes, and I have a slide prepared for that. Yeah. Uh, so if we can please show it, or maybe I can. Yeah, you can, you can come back okay. to the desk okay. just to illustrate that okay. and, and reopen your, your presentation if you Okay, want. I can do it for here, yeah. from here. So um, in the beginning, 
we did all the CT scans at our center, but now we are dealing and working with other referral centers, so the acquisition can be made there, and we receive the images. I think it's of utmost important because angio CT scan info is essential for TAVI planning. Access to be used, device to be used, sizing of the device. Uh, in two words, the only thing we need is to have good contrast opacification of the area we need to measure and avoid artifacts, mainly uh, motion artifacts, but that is not so simple. So here, here you have the technical characteristics of a good CT scan. Uh, I think the most important thing is that in a majority of centers, the CT scan uh, does not, uh, is in the radiology department, so probably the most important point is that you work with the radiology department to define the protocol, because radiologists know a lot more than we do about CT scan. But we need at least a 64 detector uh, device aiming to 128 if possible. And for aortic root scan, it's mandatory that the CT scan is EKG gated retrospectively. So we can reconstruct not only diastolic phases, but also systolic phases. We have to take care of the post-processing of the images because some EKG-related motion we can solve by the post-processing uh, and slice reconstruction. We need submillimetric slice reconstruction. In our center, we use 0.6 millimeters with an overlap of 0.3 millimeters. And of course, we need to include all the area from the clavicles to the base of the heart. Uh, you can see examples here on the left uh, with a lot of motion artifact, respiratory in the first place, heart rate in the second place that make annulus um, uh, not accurate measurements. And the peripheral scan should be easier. Radiologists are so used to perform this type of scans. But nevertheless, the important point is that you get good opacification. You don't need EKG gating. But despite that should be easier, you can see on the right that sometimes we receive scans with no contrast in the area of interest. So you cannot perform accurate measurements. So the point is to work in close relation to the radiologist EKG gated 64 uh, for the aortic root scan and try to avoid respiratory and EKG related movements. As long as you can send this information to us, we will work on it. Maybe we can ask uh, the, the panel or the, the people sitting here, like how many times CTs or patients that came with CTs from outside hospitals were inadequate. This is a question that came uh, now in the chat. Um, is it something rare? Is it something that is uh, common? No, I, I think at the beginning it's quite useful because that's a, a protocol and a study they are not used to do. So what we did is that we uh, got in contact with uh, every referral center that could be able to send out reports. We talked to the radiologist, explained them what we need it, uh, so it's getting even better. One limitation we cannot overcome is the quality of the, uh, of the CT scan itself. So if you have a 64, you have a 64, and you cannot improve that. Uh, but, but it's a learning curve, and if you work with them and review the exams with them, you get better imaging. Maybe a second question related to that is how commonly do you utilize the pre tower CT to understand the coronary vasculature? Or is it enough and not to do coronary angio? We actually, in a majority of patients, undergo coronary angio. Uh, although, as you can see in the guidelines, for example, they, they, now they command that uh, angio CT scan might be used for coronary evaluation. But still, we are re uh, relying mainly on uh, coronary angio, except for very low risk patients. And the reason for that is that most of our, our, our patients are still very old patients with a lot of calcium, and calcium in the coronaries means no reliable assessment. But if you see a patient uh, low risk for coronary artery disease and you take the scan and there is no calcium, I believe that could be used. You just to need that proximal segments are okay, and that's the, the, the easiest part of the coronary artery to evaluate. I think this is a very interesting point that we will use to go to the next part of our discussion, but I would be interesting to, to know your, your practice. So please, in, in the room, raise your hand for those who are uh, routinely performing still 
coronary angiogram uh, to assess the coronary artery routine. disease. Routine. Routine. Uh, coronary angiogram to assess the coronary artery disease before TAVI. Okay? And who is only uh, relying on the CT scan to assess coronary artery disease? So some, some of you... But I'm a bit yeah. surprised, yeah. to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. be honest. Okay. Yeah. So let, yeah. let's go now to the, the, the second part of our mutual uh, reflection on, on that topic that is more uh, centered around uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, it's, a, it's a crucial question. Uh, we, we started to discuss about how to assess coronary artery disease, but if we find some significant coronary artery disease at the time of uh, pre-op assessment, what do we have to do? So Thomas will help us to, to think about that. So perfect. Uh, thanks a lot. So my conflicts of interest are displayed on this slide. So what I think is that we need a systematic approach to patients with aortic stenosis in combination with coronary artery disease. I think as a first step, we need to ask, what is the severity of coronary artery disease? Does this patient really need revascularization at all? In a second step, I think we need to assess complexity of coronary artery disease. So is this patient a good candidate for percutaneous coronary intervention, or will he rather benefit from coronary artery bypass grafting? Once we are sure that the patient is a good candidate for TAVI, we need to assess timing of revascularization before, during, or maybe after TAVI. And eventually, there are some procedural aspects that we need to consider. So the activation trial was actually the first randomized trial comparing PCI versus no PCI in patients with aortic stenosis and coronary artery disease undergoing TAVI. So this trial was prematurely stopped because of slow recruitment. However, the com it showed comparable rates of death and cardiac rehospitalization at one year. However, there were higher rates of bleeding in the group with PCI as compared to those with no PCI before TAVI. Of note, this trial included elderly patients. The majority of patients had single vessel disease and follow-up was relatively short. So the assessment of the severity of coronary artery disease in aortic stenosis can actually be challenging since uh, the coronary hemodynamics always reflects both the combined effect of coronary artery disease and the severity of aortic valve stenosis. So there are some randomized controlled trials ongoing uh, comparing anatomical and functional assessment of coronary artery disease in patients with aortic stenosis. For example, the FATAVI trial compares an angiographic uh, guided PCI strategy versus a physiology guided PCI strategy. Favor 4 QVS uh, compares QFR guided cabbage compared to angiography uh, guided uh, cabbage. Notion 3 compares an FFR-guided complete revascularization strategy with PCI compared to a conservative management, and the transcatheter valve and vessel trial eventually compares FFR-guided PCI in combination with TAVI versus cabbage in combination with surgical aortic valve replacement. So as a next step, we need to assess complexity of coronary artery disease, and we know that higher syntax scores are associated with an increased risk of death. So a patient presenting with a syntax score of more than 32, he will be a better candidate for surgical revascularization rather than percutaneous coronary intervention. At the same time, it's not only about syntax score at baseline, but also syntax score after intervention, so the residual syntax score. And there has been a publication showing that patients with res residual syntax score above 14 face higher risk of cardiovascular death, stroke, or MI as compared to patients with complete revascularization. Once we have determined that the patient has a significant and relevant coronary artery disease that is not too complex for percutaneous coronary intervention, we need to determine the timing of intervention. And I try to summarize the drawbacks and advantages of the individual strategies before, during, or after uh, transcatheter aortic valve implantation. I think if you perform PCI before TAVI, um, you may reduce the periprocedural risk from rapid ventricular pacing. You may have straightforward coronary access. However, on the downside, you may have a certain risk of cardiac decompensation due to the volume overload. On the other hand, if you perform PCA after TAVI only, you can have an accurate functional assessment of the disease severity. On the downside, you may have 
compromised cannulation of the coronary arteries. And this is in fact a challenge. So data from the reaccess study has showed that uh, coronary cannulation was unsuccessful in seven to eight percent of all patients. And there are some predictors of unsuccessful coronary cannulation. And these are a tall stent frame, high implantation of the valve, and oversizing of the valve. And it's not only about uh, selective coronary access. This actually does have clinical implications and clinical consequences. If we look at registry data from TAVI patients presenting with ST segment elevation of myocardial infarction, we can see that these patients had significantly longer door to balloon times, uh, higher PCI failure rates, and in um, an overall adverse clinical outcomes as compared to patients with no TAVI. So what can we do to reduce this uh, problem? The answer is commissural alignment. This means the alignment of the neocommissures with the native commissures to prevent coronary overlap. So you want to prevent that one of the posts of the transcatheter heart valve is located directly in front of the offtake of one of the coronary arteries. This facilitates coronary access, but it also reduces the risk of coronary obstruction once you plan to do tough in tough in the future. So there are some universal uh, valve orientation techniques, such as how to uh, insert and advance the delivery catheter, for example, with the Evolu device, you want to position the flush port at three o'clock. But more importantly, there are also patient-specific valve orientation techniques, and I think Comaline suggested a very elegant approach. So there are several uh, steps that you can pursue. As a first step, you try to get the cusp overlap view from CT and geography. Once you identify the cusp, overlap you, you know that the direction of the right and the, uh, be, the, the direction of the commissure between the right and the left coronary artery will be directed to with the right side of the screen. In the next step, you need to identify particular markers on the valve. So for the Evolute device, this will be the hat marker. You want to position it in center front. For accurate Neo, it's going to be a free stent strut that you want to position uh, in the right side of the screen. And for Portico or Navitor, it is a post that you want to isolate on the right side of your screen. And this helps you act actually to achieve commissural alignment, which was successful in almost 90% of these patients in the Comaline study. Also, the Align Access study demonstrated that um, if you use commissural alignment, you have much higher chances of selective coronary intubation down the road as compared to patients with no commissural alignment. So in summary, in patients with aortic stenosis and coronary artery disease, the selection of the optimal treatment strategy is guided by the severity and the complexity of coronary artery disease. Factors determining timing of PCI before or during or after TAVI include hemodynamics, of course, risk of bleeding, vascular complications, maybe renal injury, and then also cost uh, issues. And uh, percutaneous coronary intervention after TAVI can actually be challenging. However, with commissural alignment, uh, these challenges can be adequately addressed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for this uh, excellent and comprehensive overview of uh, all the questions we, we have at the time of discussing this topic of coronary artery disease. Let's now come back in the situation we, we discussed at the beginning. We are in a, a, refer, a referring center. Before the TAVI procedure, we do the coronary angiogram. We are not performing TAVI in our center. And we find, um, angiographically speaking, significant coronary artery disease in a patient who is only complaining about shortness of breath, free from angina. This is a very common clinical situation, I think. And um, this deals to one of your first topic, assessment of the severity of this coronary artery disease. And this is where that usually we use physiology. I know, Flavio, you, you worked a lot and you, you have a, a lot of thoughts about this. And what would be useful, maybe, in a in few words from you, is uh, the impact of uh, a severe AS on your routine FFR measurement. Is well, it reliable to do FFR before uh, the, the aortic stenosis has been treated? Uh, absolutely, Nicola. Um, FFR, it's, uh, it's very reliable. It's a stable coronary artery disease. And then most of the patients, as you said, are not complaining from ischemia. 
Of course, it's common sense that your measurement will be more reliable if you get rid of the aortic stenosis. So anything you measure after you have removed the aortic stenosis will be more reliable. But in, in simple words, when a value is clearly positive, so it's below 0.80, it will remain positive. When it's clearly negative, which is above 0.85, it will remain negative. There is a little bit of difference in between pre and post TAVI measurements in those values that are borderline, something in between 80 and 85. So in these cases, I recommend that if you have measured this before, you re-measured it afterwards. You can do it immediately after, or you can schedule the patient one month later or three months later, which is even better. But in 95% of the cases, what you measure immediately after is enough to decide. And in many of these cases, uh, like a, a question from Juni Picari that is sitting here in the audience, you can treat uh, uh, the coronary disease and then to see whether the patient get rid of the symptoms, right? If you have like a borderline condition, and obviously the IFR and FFR assessment is a bit related also to the LV mass that is a bit different in these severe AS patients. And it takes a couple of months until there will be regression. It's not something that will happen after a couple of days. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. The, I think that the, 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 what is wrong is treating all the patients before you, you, you get rid of the aortic stenosis. But patients can't because of the aortic stenosis, unless they have unstable coronary syndrome. This is another issue, and you should take care of the coronary before. What, what is clear, uh, it's never an emergency. I mean, you don't need to do that. We have published the correlationship in between FFR, IFR, and myocardial scintigraphy. And what we have reproduced is exactly what Bernard de Brun published in, uh, in the New England many years ago. The threshold for inducing ischemia is 0.75, even in patients with aortic stenosis. So it's uh, very reproducible. It's to be considered as a stable coronary syndrome. And of course, theoretically, there are many variables that will impact the capacity of vasodilation, its blunted reaction of the microcirculation, its high LV pressure, its hypertrophy. But in practical terms, if you put a patient on the SPECT, it will have positive stress tests with adenosine if the FFR is below 75. Anything which is over 75 remains negative. So it's your decision, you know, that revascularization of stable coronary artery disease does not impact survival. It may cause angina. And so, as you said, you can take care of that one year afterwards, three years afterwards. Then the, the issue will be the access to the coronary, but we will address this later. Okay. I think thank you for, for this clarification. I think that is really helpful to, to assess the severity and then help us in, in our decision. What, what we want now is maybe make being um, even more concrete, and uh, we're going to discuss now about a real clinical case coming from uh, your, your experience, and eh, Chiara, you're, you're going to present. Yes. Um, and uh, the idea is, is just to work through the, the pathway of, uh, of a patient um, before TAVI with coronary artery disease and see uh, what, uh, what you did. Thank you, Nicholas. It's a pleasure to be here as the interventional cardiologist of the referral center. And indeed, we are going to talk about a very patient that did not happen in my real center, but in a referral in Verona, so near to Professor Ribichini. And we are talking about an 84 years old male with aortic stenosis, with worsening symptoms that was very uh, low symptomatic for angina, but with mild effort dyspnea. And as in all referral center, he underwent eco, coronary angiography, and CT. At the ECO, we have a very calcified stenosis, mean gradient 58, so very important stenosis, I would say, with an hypertrophic ventricle. In this projection of, this, of the angiography, we can see a tight lesion in the mid CX, a pre bifurcation, I would say. In this one, we can see that there is something at the end of the left main. But in the cranial wall, we can appreciate that the distal left main is severe, and we have a quite trend drop too for the right vessel. And in the right side, we found out that the patient had a chronic total occlusion, so very complex patient, I would say, three vessel disease. We performed, as usual, even in my center, the CT, and the CT showed us the really calcification of the leaflet above all in the non-coronary, so we had to face with the severe stenosis, 
complex coronary atherosclerosis, and the, our patient had a lot of comorbidities. So what do we do? We are very expert in primary PCI, but primary PCI do not mean really complex PCI. So we have patients with multivessel disease, even the carotid, multi-surgical um, intervention in past history, recent onset of atrial fibrillation, high bleeding risk patient. So we need the heart team, and the heart team is in the TAVI center. So in the TAVI center, they repeat CT, because sometimes in the referral one, there is not always the radiologist addicted to cardiac imaging. But even in this case, they confirm the really calcified leaflets of this patient. And so and yet we had to treat it. The, 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 the femoral arteries were good enough for dimension and even for calcification because we don't have all this in the femoral. So the strategy decided was to assess the functional importance of the coronary artery disease, treat the aortic stenosis, then re-evaluate the significance of the coronary artery disease, and eventually perform the PCI. Thank you, Kara. I think it, it perfectly illustrates the, the, the discussion we, we had. And uh, before to, to discuss about, about that case, I, I would like just to, to show you, we, before this session, one week ago, we, we posted a, a message on social media with just uh, two images, and maybe you will have this, uh, this poll question on, under your eyes in a few seconds. This, that, this is what, that one. So we posted this, uh, this, uh, those two images regarding this patient on the social media with the following question. Of course, limited uh, clinical information. You have more today here. So finding those coronary lesions in a patient before TAVI free from angina, what would you do? Perform PCI before TAVI, use coronary physiology assessment before TAVI to decide on PCI indication, or no revascularization, perform PCI after TAVI. So I would like you to think about those, uh, those questions, and uh, please uh, vote also uh, on, the, on the chat on the app, PCR app, because you're <coughs> allowed to do that. And meanwhile, uh, I'm just going to show you the, the outcomes we had uh, on the social media poll uh, about maybe that. Maybe we wait for the yeah. people to vote and then... Yeah, we, we yeah, influence them maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I influence them, but I think, I think it, it's interesting also for you to, to know uh, what, uh, what the colleagues uh, said, f f thought before. Uh, so here is the, the result of a social media poll you see uh, the vast two-thirds, I would say, in the, in, in the favor of uh, PCI before TAVI, and um, the remaining, um, yeah. Uh, to, to be honest, and we, we know the case, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a very challenging situation because the AS is critical. There is coronary disease that is also important, and in CTO of the RCA and the left system with a disease supports that RCA as well. It's a challenging patient, no doubt. But uh, it could be an easy TAVI that can make the PCI easier, right? So why not to switch? Why not to switch the steps? Yeah, yeah, but that's one of the questions. So Maybe we can now see what you think in the room. I think most of, most of you or the one who wanted to participate has, uh, have voted. Okay, so, so it's yeah, it's, it's evolving, but uh, I think uh, um, we are around the, the same, uh, same repartition. So about half would suggest that <coughs> we should perform the PCI before the TAVI. Yeah. Yeah. Although, we can be nervous, right? Never nervous. <laughs> Critical aortic stenosis no. patient. So free, free, a free from angina again, huh? Free from angina. Free, free, free from, from angina. angina. These are, I mean, occasional findings, which is happening 90% of the times when you do this uh, workup for pre-TAVI. I, I think one very important message is that the referral center is part of the heart team. So they perform the examinations, and with that, they solve many bottlenecks in the flow of the patients. Because of not putting patients in waiting list for the CT, for the coronary angiogram, uh, admitting them even in an outpatient um, uh, clinic for the coronary, this takes time. 
So when we get the patient from the hospital and all has been done, we have all what we need to decide the strategy. And the patient can go to the cat lab the same day he is admitted. And if everything goes okay, he can be discharged the day after, or 90% of patients go out in 48 hours. All what have been done, it's a lot of work and includes in this network, which is very important, of the decisional process, as Raquel said, your colleagues, because they, they will also take care of the patient after his discharge. So this is very important. Then we can discuss whether it is better or safer or more difficult to treat the coronary artery, but have this in mind, the patient is coming because he has aortic stenosis. We found the, the, the lesion just by chance. So my idea is treat the reason why the patient came to the hospital. And this is the aortic stenosis, it's not the left main. Would it have been di different if we were concerned about the challenge of doing PCI after the TAVR? Why should you? Exactly, because when you show the numbers, right, 7% uh, <clears throat> unsuccessful co uh, cannulation of the coronary is unsuccessful, but we, we know the devices. Maybe for us it would be 1%, 2%. If you do commercial alignment, maybe it would be something like that. Why should we be concerned I, I about I tell you, I mean, let, let's, let's suppose you are in this unfortunate 7% and you don't, you don't manage. Okay? What changes to the patient? That he remains like before. And someone else can try. Let's suppose on the other way around. You try to do this PCI on the left main, plus the CERC with the occluded right, and you have a severe aortic stenosis, and you have any kind of complication. While the patient has severe obstructions critical, of the element. Critical aortic stenosis. You know which is the difference? When you are in a TAVI center with the statistics and you have a complication, this remains in your statistics. Either it is stroke, infarction, or dying on the table. If the patient is treated in a referral center without the statistics on TAVI, this patient does not exist. He died, but he didn't die because of a complication of TAVI. He died of a complication of coronary artery angioplasty. And this is a huge universe where it is normal having this kind of complication. And we don't have any kind of information. This is an underground data that we don't know how many pay people has problems, like, for instance, mortality, before TAVI. We know everything about after TAVI, and we exactly know how many patients do not undergo the PCI because it's difficult to engage the coronary. But they are not dying because you don't engage the coronary. They may die if you have a low flow on the left main, and you have a severe aortic stenosis, and you don't manage to keep the vessel open. So that's the rationale why, first thing, do what patient needs, and he needs a valve. And then be very cautious about what is going to be the next step, if you really need to treat the artery, this is a left main, so very likely we will need to treat it, but you have all the time to decide. You can go to the hospital with all the expertise, and then you need to know the technique. I mean, there are specific techniques to re-engage the corners according to the valve type, and this is what we are talking. Okay, thank you, later. thank you, Flavio. Maybe now it's time for you and Kara to. Ah, oh, sorry, please, yes, please, 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 yeah. please. Okay, uh, thank you. I totally agree with the with the strategy that we would treat the patient according to the situation he came to the hospital, and also we have to consider that those patients which we are tackling with the BCI first, we will give him dual antiplatelet, increasing the bleeding risk, and also another issue: if we complicate the vascular access, we have to stop the dual antiplatelet, which may complicate the stent we implant before. I think we have to think about that also. Thank you very much. If, if I may add, there is something which is called kidney, and the perfusion of the kidney is impaired while you have aortic stenosis, and human beings live as long as the LV function is normal and the kidney function is normal, and both organs have the, exactly the same importance in terms of survival. When you give contrast and you have low perfusion because your cardiac output is uh, five liters, because of the aortic stenosis, the damage to the kidney is more important than when you get rid of the aortic stenosis and in five minutes, your cardiac output goes to seven liters. We have shown that the incidence of contrast-induced nephropathy, when you do anything, especially coronary procedures, which are not affecting the cardiac output, are more dangerous for the kidney than when you do coronary procedures and you don't have aortic stenosis. So this is an additional reason why we like to get rid of the you aortic know, in, stenosis. In the chat, there is a statement of uh, Giuseppe D'Ancona, which I'm going to use later on. <laughs> he, he says, the most proximal coronary stenosis is the aortic valve stenosis. You should treat it first. 
which yeah. is an interesting uh, suge suggestion for uh, for for the future. Yeah, yeah and okay. I think it's, uh, it's the perfect um, perfect conclusion about this 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 discussion, and maybe. Flavio, what would be, uh, and Cara, of course, <coughs> what, what would be interesting now is to, to see what you did. In Let's the, see the case. In that case. Let's see the case. I will just add one comment, that is that sometimes in the referral center, a uh, very PCI expert interventional cardiologist just see coronary. So sometimes they even perform complex P PCI, maybe with intraortic balloon when there is aortic stenosis, and they really do not care anymore to, to, to aortic stenosis for real. So the cooperation with the TAVI center and the referral is the principal, I think, point to, to sort out. And uh, together with Professor Ribikini, we can comment how we um, proceed with the treatment of this patient. And indeed, um, can we see the slides? Yeah, can, can we, we have start the, the yeah, video? Can we have Where we so the video the decision? ongoing? Sorry. To put the valve. <laughs> so, so, if Flavio has ice running in his arteries, that's uh, that you need to understand. It's not uh, full blood, man. No. Yes, yeah. Please. This is very nice cat lab, <coughs> and of course, he decided to go uh, at first for functional evaluation before to put the valve in place and to understand the the importance of this uh, coronary disease. So. It is intracoronary is bolus of adenosine, as we do, because you can do it intravenous, but intracoronary is it's, it's one minute, and you see the stable trace on the monitor. So this is for which lesion? Before, for the L, it's in the LED, the wire okay. is, in, so we are assessing the left main, okay. because the circ was so tight yeah, yeah. that it was... No, no about that. Yeah. So you see, it's a positive value. So at that point, we decided that we would treat the left main. So we take the operative axis. Okay, uh, with a normal uh, uh, proglide uh, pre-closing uh, technique. And uh, um, we did not say that because of the calcium, indeed the valve choice was for a, um, a self-expandable uh, uh, valve. Uh, a 29 um, Evolute Pro valve, and uh, um, uh, indeed the, the valve treatment, I don't want to spoil something, but indeed they decided to go through the valve treatment with pre-dilation with a balloon. It's common for you to do pre -dil? No, it is, it's not. It's an extremely calcified valve. It's so very maybe calcified, this is yeah. yeah, and you don't want to waste some. Sometimes patients get hypotensive when you cross with a valve and you have a left main and a right occluded. Yeah. So we did it, I mean, shy predilatation. And with this valve, they decided to, to use the commissural alignment and the, if may I even the cusp overlap technique, if am I correct? Yes. Is this your uh, habitude now? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we are confident about the depth of the valve and the commissural alignment. So in this case, it's easy to know how our valve is in place. We have to say this because you put it in the perfect position, maybe. And the, pi the pacing is done on the wire. This is another thing mm. you have eliminated, as many of you have already the, the right... It's a concept of the lean TAVI that uh, is mm -hmm. going on nowadays, I think. Any hemodynamic instability during that time? Well, this is related to the case, nothing. But I can tell you, out of 2,000 TAVIs, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a fear that has no real basis. Even when you treat patients with three vessels disease, the only moment in when patient becomes hypotensive if the patient has a baseline ejection fraction below 30, then of course. But normal LV function, coronaries do not impact on, on the hemodynamics. Uh, and this is the same thing for the self-expandable, where you don't need very rapid uh, pacing, but either for balloon expandable when you, when you do this rapid pacing. That's a very important uh, point because we have to have in mind that sometimes a TAVI procedure is less risky than the complex PCI procedure. 
Mm -hmm. So probably if you go the tabby first, good LV function and all that, that is less risky than undergoing rotablator whatsoever with a severe aortic stenosis. So that's a good point. I, I agree. I would quite say that TAVI is a PCI-like procedure in some cases like this one. But then we had to reassess the functional significance of the coronary artery disease after we solved our hemodynamics. So to choose the catheter, the right one, and we will see how to choose the best one. This is something that I do even to prepare the guide catheter outside for two reasons. You would avoid bleeding too much and bubbles, and we will see why. And of course, you have pressure. This is the more important thing. With your guide wire, you can easily um, uh, maneuver your catheter in order to put it in front of the coronary. Why? You have to perform some non-selective uh, um, angio to put the catheter in front of, because uh, this is an extra backup catheter. You cannot go into your coronary from below. You have to go um, exactly in face of the coronary ostia, and then you can move back and forward your catheter in order to find the frame. And at this point, it will be easy to push your catheter and to get the ostium. Indeed, these are the steps just to, to, to um, tell what we did. Extra backup is the most common use guiding catheter. So you just choose a size 0.5 centimeters uh, smaller. Why? Because you are inside a new aortic valve done by your device. In this case, you have your catheter, you just perform not selective uh, angiography in order to see where you have to go to get uh, the exact position, to modify it to use the guide wire. And then when you are in front of, you have just really go backward and forward to get inside the, uh, the frame. And at this point, the, um, the ostium will be your, yours. After this, you are stable. You don't have hemodynamic instability because there is no more aortic stenosis, and you reassess the functional uh, importance by performing the FFR again. So the result, as you can see, it was positive before. He stayed positive after. In, in this case, there is no need to repeat it because it was 0.72, and as I said, 0.72 may become 0.69 but will never become 85. We just repeated to show you that it was exactly the same. I mean, this was done on purpose for, for you, not to convince you, but to show you that there is By no the way, variability. why EBU and not JL? The majority of us would use a passive guide and not uh, EBU. I like it. <laughs> you have only one bend. I mean, I don't like We need, we need to be happy. I, no, <laughs> well, I, I, I used to use Jatkins when I, when no, no, I was at the it, second. It, it actually worked beautifully. Yeah, right? It, it has nice. only one bend. Jatkins has two angulations, and I think you have to deal with two. But sometimes it's necessary. When, when, the, up, when, when the takeoff of the left main is, is very vertical, then the, the 3.5 yeah. might be easier. Sure. But, sure. Sure. Yeah. I will just comment that the patient was so stable and that TAVI implant was so easy and recanulation so easy as well that Professor Bikini chose to treat with FFR evaluation with uh, imaging guiding, so as the valve was not in place, and then he performed a complex PCI, I would say, because it's a distal left main, <coughs> and we'll see what he, he did later. It, it, it. It is a little bit, I mean, unnecessary to show you step by step the it's coronary yeah. procedure itself, but it's to show you that the way you treat this artery is exactly the same you would do in a patient without aortic stenosis and without a valve. That's, that, that's the, the message. Huh? You see, it, all what you would do in a patient with this lesion can be done through the core valve. Yes, but indeed, I would all even say that it's not necessary, but this procedure went well, but what if we have treated before without the valve in place and with dissection? Or maybe uh, thrombus and embolization because the plaque got complicated. Or if we, it's a, it is the left main, we, ha, we have a bifurcation in it because there is circumflex getting out. So it's not an easy one. So I think the steps by steps, even because you treated the circumflex after 
putting the left main, uh, the stent in the left main, it's something that you can do because you are confident of the hemodynamic stability of your patient. I think it's an important point to do because it's complex. It's a complex PCI, not only, I think, for fellows or for young uh, interventionalists. There is a comment here regarding the selection of the TAR THV device here and whether balloon expandable device uh, uh, could have been preferred over Evolut, knowing that there would be like a complex PCI afterwards. But to be honest, we see such a beautiful cannulation. All of us, we do PCIs from time to time after Evolut. This is, uh, we manage. It's not uh, such a big deal. Right? Yeah, yeah. But maybe, maybe Flavio, you can uh, comment a little bit more why on I, that. Why, why, no, yeah. why I selected the... Yeah, the or, or in other words, um, does the fact that you find severe or significant coronary artery disease you want to treat afterwards as an impact of your valve choice at the well, time of TAVI? It, it's a long-lasting story. I mean, the first, the first cases we started doing this way, putting the valve before, uh, we were actually, and I have to admit this, we were not aware about problems uh, accessing. I mean, the, the problem of the access is, is more recent. And we started doing it naturally, and actually sometimes was a little bit more difficult. Then we developed this protocol of measuring FFR before and after, and this was done independently of the type of valve. And sometimes it was a little bit more difficult or less difficult, but then you get used as everything, and then it became natural. Then another thought was that avoiding rapid patient was safer, but as I said, even when you use a balloon expandable, coronary artery disease does not create problems, not to the balloon expandable either. And now why we do it? Well, for this case, because it's a Medtronic sponsored session. Um, and now normally, because uh, a, we, we keep on training our younger people and our colleagues to get used to go to the access of the coronary through the self-expandable valves. So, One question, Flavio. Uh, knowing that tall valves and higher implants have been related to a more difficult coronary access good in this case, for example, aim not to such a high implant because ah. the result is very good, but for me, it's probably not as high as we are implanting nowadays. What do you think? And of course, th this is done on purpose. You see that the positioning was done in the cusp of the lab, but we were happy with these four millimeters, not with two. Of course, the, the, the ground zero, the higher you go, the more possibilities you have to have some tissue in front of the, of the corners. And it doesn't mean that you will not get in, but it will be a little bit more difficult. So normally you should respect what are the instructions for use to stay in the regular. Of course, you don't have to implant a low valve because you are worried about the access to the corners, but of course, the higher it is, the more demanding it will be, especially if the alignment is not perfect. And I will just add that I think that all of us, we need to become comfortable with the access after TAVI. Why? Because we are treating patients at lower risk, younger, and we have some data about the unplanned PCI post TAVI. In the majority of cases, very low, 0.9%, we have acute coronary syndrome. So whoever could treat an acute coronary syndrome after the TAVI procedure, maybe two years later, but the valve would always be in plus. So I think that there are some steps that we need to really um, know by heart by now. Thank you. There are many uh, questions about uh, uh, the technique, and we will not dive into any uh, all the questions here. But uh, radial versus femoral in post uh, TAVI PCI, six French versus maybe to increase the, the 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 size of the the system. What do you think, guys? Like post TAVI PCI in a patient with a face sinuses which you can predict that it will be more challenging in a, than an average PCI, would you go femoral? Thomas, maybe? Would you go Please. I mean, first you need to decide on the overall strategy, and I think in this patient, I mean, I would also uh, try to treat the aortic valve first and then only go for a complex PCI, so I wouldn't probably dare to do a complex PCI before having treated the critical aortic stenosis in such a case. So, And then I think, I mean, um, it, it depends a little bit. I mean, if you, I think coronary access is probably not that much of an issue as we have discussed as, le uh, as long as you did a commercial, commercial alignment. And then if you go for a second procedure, I would probably rather uh, choose a, a radial approach for, for a planned PCI after Tavi. 
Yeah, I would, I would do so. I would try my, my conventional radial approach. And if for anatomical reasons we can find, a, sometimes it's a difficulty, uh, then shift to transfermal, but would not change my, my procedure because the patient had a, a previous study. Yeah, me neither. We are radialists at my center, so in the majority of cases, if possible, we go radial, even if the valve is in place. Then, if you really have some problems, so we will switch to femoral, but for, I think for any case of complication in the radial axis. In any setting, because uh, we have to face that we are maybe more used to, to coronary access after TABI, but the patient with, uh, with a stable angina, angina is completely different uh, from the patient with an acute coronary syndrome. And that patient is going to arrive to any center. And uh, the interventionalist in the referral center may not be used to, to uh, coronary arteries and TABI. So maybe I'm not so sure that in the referral center uh, it's not a good idea to go femoral. Uh, I, I could think about that, and if it's, it might be a challenge case, and it's 4 a.m. in the morning, and an interventional is not used to, to get coronary access with TABI, I would maybe have in mind try femoral first, because we, we, we feel uh, easier much, uh, sometimes yeah. with that. You're right, and this is where I would like us to, to go before to, to finish. Again, that situation, you, you sent your patient to, to your TAVI center, he had an, an Evolute, and one year after you're on call and you have to come back on a Saturday night at 1 a.m. for an STEMI. You have this patient on, on your table, uh, you go femoral, you try, it's um, probably a, a circumflex tight lesion, you try to be selective and you, you can't manage to be selective in, uh, in, your, in your left main. And this is where I would like to have your input, Flavio, about that. How, what guidance you could provide to our colleagues working in such center or for such situation in order to uh, successfully perform the PCI? Uh, if I have 30 seconds, I'd say always use a guiding catheter because if it's difficult to engage and then you have to get into the artery, you can do it. You cannot do it with the diagnostic and then never struggle to get to inside the artery. You not need to be selective. You use your Air wire, coronary wire. wire, and once you have your wire, you, are, you have the, the job done because then you can put an extension or a balloon and anchoring, and while you do that, the guiding will follow the wire and will get it. You don't need very support because the, the catheter staying on the diamond of the, of the valve becomes very stable. Obviously, having an advice from the person that did the procedure and maybe to have a, an autogram clip sent to you to understand like the location and the relationship uh, yeah, and the and helpful if, guide extension. If an emergency, perform a, a non-selective autogram with a pigtail so you see where is the, the, the left main or the right, yes. There is a question whether we can, uh, doing PCI after tower, we can uh, like uh, uh, embolize clot material from the aortic root. I, to be honest, I uh, never had an issue uh, that I remember related to that. Um, generally, these are very easy procedures. No, but if we remember on that, if you perform, just maybe to reassure colleagues also, if you perform such PCI, but maybe early one week after TAVI, any risk for valve embolization while manipulating the guiding after? Never, never heard just. I mean, we didn't mention in the video, the recommendation is to retrieve the guiding before and then the wire. So you, you get sure that the, 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 the guiding is not engaged in the valve, but it's more a precaution than a, a, a certainty. Never happened. So thank you so much. I'll just to summarize several of the things that we, we brought. That was a fantastic uh, session, uh, Nicola. Uh, the referral centers should be, it, it is clear, they are part of the TAVA pathway. They are part of the TAVA pathway. They should be embraced and be involved. And uh, obviously, each relationship should define what, how, where should be the pre-TAVA CT be performed or pre-TAVA PCI if needed to be performed. But they should be part of the, the, the team. Uh, with a single referral point uh, in, in your center that could, could be uh, the, the contact for, for that relationship. With regard to the post uh, tower PCI procedures, we, there were a lot of concepts that we brought up during the, this session, but one thing that is clear to me, and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure to you, Flavio, 
is that the post uh, tower PCI is not a big, big concern. We manage, we do that uh, all the time. I'm sure that now with commissural alignment, the challenges we're doing post tower PCI would even decrease uh, much further. And uh, I think we'll finish with that. Thank you very much for being here.